Good morning, ladies. So today we have one additional facilitator joining us today. I'm gonna to let her introduce herself. She'll be with us through the rest of the summer. She's our new counseling intern and she just started uh, last month and she'll be taking on a caseload of new clients starting in August. So um, anyone who's on the wait list may get to work with Giselle soon. So I'll let her introduce herself. Hello, I'm glad to be here. My name is Giselle, I'm a counseling student at Mason, and I'm looking forward to meeting you ladies. I worked for Alexandria CSB for two years. Prior to that, I was living in Baltimore. I worked at Johns Hopkins Hospital at the Community Psychiatry Center. And before that, I worked at a small community agency in Baltimore as well, Universal Counseling Services. I love this field and I'm looking forward to meeting you. So today we're going to be talking about emotions and self-esteem and self-worth. So we're going to, some of it might be repetitive as far as what you guys read in the homework. If you didn't get to the homework, then it won't be repetitive, but we're going to try to expand a little bit on what the homework talked about. So emotions, am I allowed to have emotions? Often in a dysfunctional family, you are not allowed to express your feelings. So if you express sadness, you may get in trouble or your parents may make fun of you. If you express anger, you may be told to go to your room when, or get away. So when we tell our children to go to their room, that signals to them, when you're having this emotion, I don't wanna be around you. So I always tell people um, when they're parenting, that should be the last resort of sending them off because even though that might not be what you're intending, that's what they interpret. So if you were ever told, you, you can't be angry, go to your room, I don't wanna be around you. That's what your brain is interpreting as, they don't wanna be with me when I'm expressing this emotion, therefore I cannot have that emotion. It can also make you feel like you're not loved when you have that particular emotion. So if you're feeling sad and somebody in your family makes fun of you, then obviously you're not gonna to wanna to show your sadness again because that is not a safe place to have that emotion. So dysfunctional families, they place those limits on expressing feelings and there's not enough room for more than one family, to, family member to have that emotion. So there may be uh, one particular family member, mom, dad, sibling, that they're the ones who are allowed to have those emotions, but you were not allowed to have those emotions. It might be a parent and my kid, it just depends on the particular family and it could change throughout the years too. It might not always be the same person but that leaves all the other people in the family to feel like they cannot share their emotions. It's not a safe place because all that energy is placed on one of the family members. So usually people in a dysfunctional family, they're told either bluntly or in a passive aggressive way that they're not allowed to have the emotions, um, that they're not allowed to express emotions. So when you're told not to express your emotions, your body suppresses the emotion. Has everyone heard of suppressing emotions? All right, this is not a good thing for long term because the emotion has to go somewhere. I always use an analogy of a soda bottle. If you shake the soda bottle and open it, it's gonna have to come out. So the emotion has to go somewhere at some point in some form. So you can push it aside for the time being, you can push it aside for years actually, but at some point it's gonna come out. It could come out in physical sickness, it could come out high blood pressure, low self-esteem, poor memory actually, increased risk of heart disease, anxiety, depression, or anger management issues. I've worked with a lot of people who have physical health issues due to suppressed emotions and maybe they don't realize that's what it's from and it's due to other things as well, but your body is directly connected to emotion. Like our body, God created our body so amazing that it, every piece works together. So if you're suppressing those emotions, it will come out in some way or the other. So how do we get in touch with our feelings? Did you guys read in the homework about how people avoid their feelings? Maybe you do some of those. We're gonna talk a little bit more about those and then we're going to talk about how not to avoid our emotions. I wanna delve a little bit more into healthy and unhealthy coping skills. I'm sure you have all heard the word or the term coping skills it's in the counseling field. It's one of our favorite words to say, but coping skills are 
a way that we cope with our emotions and they can be healthy or unhealthy. So what would be an example of a unhealthy coping skill that somebody could do? What? Binge eating. Binge eating, yeah. Or drinking. drinking. What about some healthy coping skills? What would be an example of a healthy coping skill? Sports, yes, those are, those are a great coping skill for teenagers especially. Journaling. Exercise, journaling. Good. I'm glad you guys already, I don't even need to keep talking. <laughs> so sometimes these coping skills happen automatically. Sometimes we choose to do them. Sometimes our body just naturally does it, and they all serve a purpose. So in the time, for a certain time, the coping skill can be healthy. Some of these on the screen that we're going to talk about and that was talked about in the homework, they're all, they were done in, at that time for a purpose, and that's okay. So don't beat yourself up if you have done these in the past, because sometimes our bodies need to use this coping skill to just get through that moment. So sometimes the moment is just so difficult that we have to be in denial for a little bit, and that's okay. It's when it lasts um, longer, and when you don't deal with that emotion, then that's when it becomes harmful. So intellectualizing is using logic or reason to avoid emotion. So an example of this would be if your roommate says that they're moving out, instead of identifying that feeling, you start making a list of all the ex added expenses that you ha are going to have and what your budget is going to be. So you don't allow yourself to feel angry, sad, lonely. You just focus on the logistics of it. So you, in a way, you're kind of using logic and reasoning to avoid ha experiencing and expressing that emotion. Another example is if a loved one dies, instead of focusing on the grief, you put all of your energy into planning the funeral and making sure everything is going correct and you don't actually allow yourself to experience that grief. So these are ways that you intellectualize to stop yourself from having that unwanted emotion. I put an emotion wheel on all the tables. Well, Christine put an emotion wheel on all the tables for me. And there are unwanted emotions on there. There's emotions that people would say are negative or bad emotions. And so there's definitely emotions that are not fun to have, right? There's some emotions that we enjoy. That we enjoy uh, joyful, happiness, all those positive emotions, right? But the more negative emotions are the unwanted emotions that we don't want to have. So with intellectualizing, it can be it's not necessarily bad in the moment because sometimes with grief we have to plan that funeral because nobody else is going to do it but it's when it gets to the long term that it can be harmful so sometimes it is necessary in that moment but if it becomes a pattern that's when you need to be mindful of kind of breaking that pattern and really allowing yourself to feel that emotion so minimizing is when you downplay the emotion and the situation you, you belittle the situation or emotion and you discount the emotion. So an example of this would be saying, oh no, well, it could be worse. So you say, oh, this is happening to me. And then you immediately say, but it could be worse or somebody else has it harder. I hear that a lot in my counseling sessions. They share what happened and they're like, but somebody else probably had a worse week. And I always say, it doesn't matter what somebody else had it. Like you had a bad week and that is a valid emotion and that is okay you don't have to dismiss it by saying oh well somebody else has it worse another example is if you let's see you could if somebody was telling you a situation um, that happened to them and you could also kind of minimize that for them as well and you could say oh yeah well i also had the same situation happened to me and this is how it happened. And in a way that's minimizing their experience because when somebody says something, shares an experience with you, it's best to just let them share that and not try to input into, oh yeah, I had that same experience. So denial, denial is when you fail to acknowledge or an, an unacceptable emotion or truth. So it can sometimes seem like it's irrational, but it's used as a defense mechanism. I'm sure you've all heard of the word defense me mechanism. So it's for anything that is really challenging or painful, and you just say, yeah, it didn't happen. This is also one of the stages of grief, so this does happen a lot with grief. So an example of this would be somebody who is in denial about being an alcoholic. They're, let's say, I get up every day, I go to work, I just 
drink three glasses, four glasses of wine when I get home. They're in denial of their alcohol problem, but they are, they don't even recognize it or see it because they say, oh, well, I'm still functioning. I'm still able to work. So again, denial can be okay in the moment. It's really, again, as if it goes long-term, it's sometimes it's okay to have that denial in that moment to just get through that situation. And again, it's when it's the long term and it becomes a pattern. So for the next one, this one is pretty self-explanatory, isolating. Isolating is when you isolate yourself. But the main piece of this is you isolate so you don't have to share your emotions with people. So you may still hang out with people, you still may go out with people, but you keep it surface level. You don't open up as to what's going on. You might listen to what other people are going through, but you don't ever share. So obviously this can be very harmful in the long term if you're just keeping all the emotions inside and not going deeper with people. Swallowing a feeling. I was Googling this one and Google does not know what <laughs> this one means. They kept bringing up swallowing disorders. I'm like, no, 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 that's not what it means. So swallowing a feeling is when you feel like you need to cry, but you don't allow yourself to cry. So um, example of this is if you find out bad news about a loved one, then your husband and kids come into the room and then you immediately, you're about to cry, but then they come in and you immediately are like, okay, I'm in mom mode right now, I can't do this. And you just swallow that cry and then go on with the day. So you're not talking about it. You're just kind of pretending that it's not bothering you. Another example would be going for a run when you have, when you feel like you're gonna cry or you feel like you just are really struggling and you don't wanna acknowledge the emotion, you go for a run. Again, this is, going for a run is a great coping skill, but if you do it in that particular moment, what it could be telling your body is that, okay, I'm not allowed to have this emotion right now, so I'm going to do something else so that I don't have to pay attention to this emotion and really let myself sit in the emotion for a little bit. And then the last one is taking care of others. So I don't know how many of you feel like you do this one, but sometimes you will drop everything at the call of a friend and you will go and you will do whatever they need to do, even if your life is falling apart and you don't even have the mental capacity to do it or to help them, you'll drop everything that you're doing to go help them. And then on the way home, you're like, oh man, and it just is, you're just running away from your own emotions and focusing on helping other people. Now, obviously we're supposed to help other people. So this one in itself is not a necessarily unhealthy all the time. It's only when you're diminishing your emotion and ignoring your emotion in order to take care of somebody else. So all of these, I don't know if you see a common theme, all of these are not bad in and of themselves, right? It's when you're not allowing yourself to sit in the emotion that that's when it becomes unhealthy. So how do we allow ourselves to be okay with emotions? Emotions are not something that a lot of people like talking about. I'm surprised some of you didn't leave when I said we're talking about emotions today because it's not necessarily, people aren't like, yeah, we get to talk about emotions. A lot of people try to avoid emotions, whether they grew up in a dysfunctional family or not. So how do we, how are we okay? And how do we be okay with our emotions? So instead of in intellectualizing, acknowledge how you feel, the physical effects on your body. And we're gonna do an activity in a little bit to practice how to do that. But you put the situation in a different context and you give yourself the, and allow yourself the opportunity to feel and the opportunity to grieve because emotions are okay to have. Instead of minimizing, you take a look at the impact of your emotions. So intense emotions are not bad. I call them, when my toddlers have, I call them big emotions when they have these intense emotions. And I say, you're having big emotions right now and that is okay. I still will not let you hit me, but you're having big emotions, right? So you acknowledge the emotions are okay. It is okay to be angry right now. It's not okay to hit me, but it's okay to be angry. Um, you identify what you're feeling. You accept your emotions, all of them, even the bad ones that you don't want to accept. Keeping a mood journal is a great option. Taking a deep breath. I know that is probably my favorite coping skill, especially with little kids. I take several deep breaths every day <laughs> before I speak. But taking a deep breath and just allowing yourself to, okay, 
I'm not gonna react, I'm just going to feel this emotion, this emotion is okay, and just the act of taking a deep breath is so, can be so relaxing. Um, sometimes giving yourself space is also okay. I also do this, sometimes I'll sh lock myself in the bathroom and say, I need a couple minutes. You know, it's okay to give yourself space when you're having these big emotions if you don't wanna have express them around, if it's not a safe place to express them. So give yourself those, the space so that you can express them, not, if not with others, at least by yourself. So instead of denial, honestly examine what you fear. So think about a potential negative consequence for not taking action. Allow yourself to express your fears and your emotions. Try to identify any irrational beliefs about your situation. I think this is a huge one and there's a lot of different techniques that as counselors we use to identify these irrational beliefs and then kind of switch them into an alternative way. Journaling again about your experience or about the irrational belief and then opening up to a trusted friend or a loved one. And I know this is a, this can be a hard one, opening up to who is a trusted friend and how many people do I have to share my emotions with? And what if I share it with this person and then they go and tell someone. And so this is one that is, could be, it's not necessarily gonna happen right away. You might have to build that relationship and really find somebody that is a trusted friend um, and loved one. And then participate in a support group, which is what you guys are all doing here. So instead of isolating, you can be active and physical. So force yourself to get out of bed, to get out of the basement, to get outside, go for a walk, create some sort of structure to your day. I don't know if any of you with kids um, that are in school within in the summer, things just seem so chaotic where there's no schedule. So having a schedule to your day I mean, I'm type A personality, so I need a schedule. But any, everyone needs some sort of schedule. If you just wake up and are like, I don't know what I'm gonna do today, then that's really easy for you to then isolate because you don't have a plan. So plan fun outings that are diverse for you, that maybe are pushing you a little bit. And then focus on connecting with people. I don't know if you're noticing a theme of connecting with others. It's, it's probably in all of these actually now that I'm thinking about it, but it's so important to connect with other people So instead of swallowing the feeling allow yourself to cry It is okay, and it is good for you to cry. I know it's not fun to cry I mean, Some people like crying, but most of us don't like crying, right? So it's not a fun emotion to have but it is a great way to express how you're feeling if you just bot bottle it all up you're gonna get tense and your back is, and your shoulders are gonna start hurt, hurting, but just releasing that emotion and allowing yourself to cry. If you're crying for like three hours, okay, well then that's where that might become a problem. But if you're just allowing yourself to express that emotion and really processing that and then moving on from it, that's the most healthy way to deal with your emotions. So in instead of taking care of others, make sure you're doing self-care. Another one of counselors' favorite words, self-care. But it is, so, it is so important because if you're only taking care of other people, if you're a wife, if you're a mom, you're always taking care of somebody else. So when are you taking care of yourself? So this could be anything. Going out in the sun, exercising, taking a bath. I can't remember the last time I've taken a bath. <laughs> Reading a book, not a self-help book, but like a fun romance or murder mystery or whatever you like. I like reading Nicholas Sparks books and then I cry at the end, so it gets two for one, right? Eating a healthy meal. I always feel so much better after I eat a healthy meal. Spending time with friends, getting a good night's sleep. Sleep is so important with anxiety and managing emotions. If you have a lack of sleep, your anxiety and your depression is going to be so much worse. There's, I went to a training not too long ago and it was talking about the connection of sleep, exercise, and anxiety and how all of them are so connected. And if you don't have sleep or exercise, then the anxiety is going to be way worse and more increased. Getting a pedicure or manicure, walking around the mall, and again, deep breathing is a great way for self-care. So now that we talked about avoiding feelings and being okay with your emotions, we're gonna do an exercise. So this exercise is focused on allowing yourself to identify the emotion that you're feeling right now, and then identifying 
how it feels on different parts of your body. So I know not everyone is going to be comfortable identifying what their emotion is. Maybe it's a good emotion, maybe it's a bad emotion, but I want everyone to humor me and just go along with it. Since we're here, we might as well do it, right? All right, so I want everyone to put both feet on the ground and I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think about what emotion you are feeling, not just happy, sad, but really try to think, and if you need to open your eyes and use the emotion wheel to pick your emotion, that's fine, but really try to think about what emotion you're feeling. Are you feeling defeated? Are you feeling discouraged? Are you feeling joyful? Now I want you to scan your body and see how this emotion is affecting different parts of your body. How is your neck? Is it feeling tense? Is it feeling tight? How are your legs? Are your legs stiff? Your arms? Your jaw, is your jaw clenched and tight? So keep going through the different parts of your body and seeing how this emotion is impacting the different parts of your body. And then when you're ready, open your eyes. Come back to the room. How was that for everyone? Was that weird? <laughs> what, do you feel relaxed? So were you guys able to identify the emotion that you were feeling? Did it feel uncomfortable? No. Did it feel, do you feel relaxed? Okay. I know often when I do this exercise, people don't like it because it forces them to think about their emotions when often we try to be so busy and go, go, go. I don't want to stop and think about how I'm feeling. I often ask my clients, how are you feeling today? And they look at me, they're like, I don't know, I just, I made it here, okay? <laughs> I'm like, yes, that's great, but how are you feeling? And they take a minute and they're able to identify, oh, this is how I was feeling today. I didn't even realize I was feeling that because I was so busy going, going, going that I didn't allow myself to have that emotion. So on the screen, there, these are two great ways to identify your emotions. Like I said, there's a feelings wheel at each table, and then the other one is an emotions poster. And I love the emotions poster for kids. We have one at our house, just on the wall, and it's a great way for kids to be able to start learning about emotions and learning what their emotions are. And they have tons of them that you can get with different funny faces and stuff. And my kids love going up and pointing to what emotion they're feeling. And then I try to get them to show me on their face and they, they're, it's usually pretty funny what they come up with. So I want you to take a minute and pass the uh, feelings wheel or the emotion wheel around, at, around your table. And I want you to just look at it, get familiar with it and see if there's a emotion on there that is surprising to you or you didn't expect to see on there. I know there's a lot on there. But the way that the emotion wheel works is it starts with a more generic emotion in the center. So you'll have your generic happy, sad, fearful, surprised, and then it goes out to be more specific. So it's like each triangle goes out so that it's more specific so that you can really identify. Because sometimes like, I'm so angry right now. And then I look at the emotion wheel, I'm like, oh, I'm not really angry. I'm more jealous or I can more specifically identify what emotion I'm feeling. And they do have this in the form of a pillow, which if you've ever been in my office, I have this as a pillow and it's the best pillow ever. I love it. I've had several of my clients buy it from Amazon after they come in because they're like, this is so cool. And then they just keep it on their bed and it's a great reminder of emotions. So are there any emotions on there that you are surprised to see on there or that you hadn't thought of as an emotion before? Surprised. surprised. <laughs> Aroused, busy, bored. bored. Yeah, I was talking to somebody yesterday. They're like, yeah, I was bored, but I know that's not an emotion. I was like, no, that is, that is an emotion. All right, so I would encourage any of you, I mean, you can just print this offline too if you don't want to go and buy the pillow. The pillow's more fun, but you can just print it out. But this is a, yes? Does, is there any, anything about the intensity or anything like having to do with how it's 
Yeah, so usually the further circle out is more intense. Yeah, so if you look at them, like under anger, hostile is in the furthest circle. So it's not as intense as aggressive, but it gets further out. Each one gets more intense the further out you go. So that outer circle is going to be the most intense emotions. Yep, good question. All right, so I am going to say something that your parents probably did not say to you growing up. And I've already said it a few times, but I want you all to really listen to me when I say this, that emotions are healthy and emotions are okay. I would even venture to say that emotions are good. If we express these emotions in a healthy way, emotions are good to have, even these emotions that are unwanted or negative. It's okay to have the emotions of disappointed even if you were told you couldn't have that emotion. It's okay to have the emotion of frustrated, horrified, jealous. These are all okay emotions to have. It's okay to allow yourself to have emotions. Uh, when you suppress the emotion, you are telling your body unintentionally, but you're telling your body that that emotion is not okay. So the next time that you feel that emotion, your body automatically tries to get rid of that emotion because you told yourself it was not okay. When your parents tell you, oh, stop crying, that tells you that emotion is not okay. It is not okay to be sad and therefore I cannot cry. So all these little things that people don't even realize that they're saying how they affect you, your body is internalizing them as that emotion is not okay. So I want you all to say this with me, and then I'm gonna, you can be done listening to me. I'll turn it over to Tatiana. My emotions are okay. I want you all to say that. My emotions are okay, and my emotions are healthy. My emotions are healthy. All right, Tatiana, it's all you. All right, good morning, ladies. All right, it's good to see your beautiful faces. Today I have the privilege and honor of speaking to you about the difference between self-esteem and self-worth. All right, if you grew up in a dysfunctional household with a dysfunctional family, uh, you probably get these two confused, and that's okay. We're here to talk about what they mean today. So self-esteem is your confidence in your ability to get the job done. So it's derived from the things that you do. It's your external value, okay? Looks very different than self-worth. Self-worth is derived from who you are. It's your intrinsic value. So it's so important that we know the difference between these two because oftentimes in my office, I'll get a client who may get these two confused because of their upbringing. <clears throat> if the only way that you got attention and validation and affirmation in your childhood was by performing a role, then it's only understandable that you would confuse the two, right? And so self-esteem, again, just uh, in case you missed it the first time, it's derived from what you do. It's your external value, whereas self-worth is your intrinsic value derived from who you are. Who remembers the roles that we talked about last week? The five roles in dysfunctional families. We had the mascot, the scapegoat, the family hero. You guys were listening, paying attention, I like that. Uh, the, the chief enabler, right? And then we also had the lost child. So what does self-esteem have to do with growing up with a dysfunctional family? If, again, I can't say this enough, I can't stress this enough, if you grew up in a dysfunctional household, you might confuse your worth with based off of the roles that you played. So if you were the mascot of the family, maybe you learned, okay, the more jokes that I can just tell, the more funny that I am, the more that I am able to ease the tension in the family, the more valuable I will feel. Maybe if you were the family hero, you might say to yourself, well, if I can just get more A's, if I can just be more productive, if I can just be busy and fill my calendar with all the things, I'll have more worth. 
the lost child, right? The one who just stays out of the way, who's probably in the bedroom watching TV or playing video games all day long. If that was you as a child, you might just say to yourself, well, if I can just stay out of the way and not make a commotion, maybe then my parents will finally see me, right? So you somehow, some way, that narrative has been internalized where my role is what gets me love. So it's so important that we identify, well, what do I believe of myself? What do I believe of my worth? Do I truly believe that I have value? Even if all my roles were taken from me, do I believe that I am worthy? I would probably guess that maybe a lot of you struggle with feelings of unworthiness or maybe even fluctuating self-worth. And so an example of this in the Bible, if I can, is I, I like to use this example is Mary and Martha. Are you ladies familiar with Mary and Martha? Yeah. So this is me paraphrasing. I'm not going to read scripture to you today, but if you can recall, right, Mary and Martha are two sisters. Martha, she's a doer, right? She, uh, she knows the Messiah is coming to her house, so she is getting the house ready, cooking, cleaning, doing all the things, and her sister Mary is not being helpful. <clears throat> and Martha, as an outsider looking in on this story, I think that she probably has very high self-esteem. She trusts in her ability to cook, to clean, to be hospitable, right? Those are not bad qualities to have, right? And so she's busy at work doing all the things, and then Mary is in the living room chilling with Jesus, right? Sitting at his feet. And so what does Martha do? If you guys remember from Luke chapter 10, she gets mad, right? And she goes to the living room and she says, Jesus, tell my sister to help me. And Jesus says to her, look, I get that you're upset. Even Jesus validated emotions. Isn't that cool? But Mary has chosen what is better of the two, and it will not be taken from her. And so he's not saying doing the things is a terrible thing. He's saying that when you're focusing on your self-worth and self-esteem, you have to prioritize those two. You have to ensure that you focus on your self-worth first. You must first be, and that will enable you to do. So how do we do that? How do we focus on our self-worth? That is something that is very difficult, especially when you've been conditioned all your life to just perform, to just do, to just play a role. And I'm about to tell you right now, so if you're taking notes, I want you to pay attention, please. Self-worth in Christ. The first thing that you need to do is to declare, I cannot do this. I cannot give myself worth. And I don't know about you ladies, but for me, anytime that I try to identify my worth, what ends up happening is I fall into listing all the things that make me a good person, right? Like, well, I'm worthy because I'm a good mom and I got up at 3 a.m. to take care of my baby and let my husband sleep. Or I'm worthy because I'm a good counselor. Or I'm worthy because I'm a good wife. Or I'm worthy because fill in the blank with your own role, right? We cannot do it as Christian women. But it's also declaring that we know the one who can. God can. Step two. God can. In fact, he already has, right? 2,000 years ago, he sent his one and only son to die a brutal death for you. And I know that sometimes we get that in our mind. Like we understand that concept, but we don't actually really feel it in our hearts. It's really recognizing that if you were the only person on planet Earth, he still would have done it for you. Step three, deciding that I'm going to let him. I'm done doing it for myself. Every time I do it, it's a mess. I'm going to let him. My identity and my worth is found in Christ and what he has done for me, right? You are not responsible for how maybe your parents have treated you in the past, but now you are responsible for what you're going to do about it and how you're going to move forward and how you're going to heal 
Maybe you didn't feel worthy in the past by your earthly father, but your heavenly father gives you the ultimate worth. And the last step here is what, really reflecting on what am I actually letting go of? Really reflecting on it. I would encourage you ladies, if you get some journaling time, maybe later on today, when I do these steps and recognize that I do not define my worth, but God can and he does, and I'm going to decide to let him do it, what's the baggage that I'm letting go of? Right? So maybe if you were the mascot or if you were the chief enabler, maybe it's the need to control other people's perception of me. Right? The chief enabler, what do they do? If you can recall from last week, they were the individuals of the family who had to protect the family unit. There was so much dysfunction within the household, but no one else could know. You had to protect the sanctity of the family, right? And so you were controlling other people's perception of you in a way and of the family. And so maybe you've internalized that today. But when you follow these steps and you're no longer doing and operating and becoming busy Martha, you're letting go of wanting to control other people's perception of you. Maybe if you were the lost child, right? Maybe your parents kind of treated you in a way where you were forgotten. And so you've internalized that. And maybe you're a mom here today and you say, well, my children will never feel that way. I'm going to ensure that they know that they are loved, that they are valued. But sometimes if we're being honest, we can take that a step too far. I know I can. So really reflecting on if you were the lost child, the need to control what happens in my kid's life, constantly worrying, constantly anxious about their futures, constantly worried about the spouses that they're gonna marry, right? That's not your baggage to carry. And the last example here that I have for you, if you were the family hero, if you were constantly doing and your accolades and your accomplishments were the one that got you some type of affirmation as a child, what you are letting go of is the fear and anxiety that I feel when I encounter new experiences and the compulsion to work constantly and be busy. And I know that that's kind of hard because we live in Northern Virginia, but I'm telling you today that God does not ask us to be busy. He calls us to be productive. And so thank you ladies for listening to this, uh, this short two slides here on self-esteem and self-worth. And I wanna actually do an exercise if we can, this is not planned, but I want us to kind of reflect on, on a scale of one to 10. You're gonna be writing it down in just a little bit and hopefully you can share with your uh, peers here at your tables. On a scale of one to 10 with one being very, very low and 10 being very, very high. What is your self-esteem? And go ahead and write it down. Now I want you to reflect on your self-worth. Do you believe you have intrinsic value? If all those roles were taken from you, if you were no longer mom, wife, daughter, counselor, admin clerk, do you still believe that Jesus would have died for you and you alone? And write that down. All right, ladies, thank you so much. Now we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to the small group discussions here. Feel free to share amongst yourselves your ratings. And also we have some questions here that are on the board so you can read them. Mm -hmm.